calling the ooh, January 17th Petaluma City Schools Board of Education meeting to order at 5.05. We're acknowledging AB 361, still in a hybrid format, at least for the next 30 days. Um, are there any comments from the public on closed session items? Dave and I are the only two in the chat. Oh, okay. All right, we will adjourn to closed session. And I'm also to address suspension rates at both sites. Through this work, we've greatly reduced the number of suspensions between our schools over the last three years. This diversion program has been amazing at addressing and working through suspendable issues using restorative practices with our students. Valerie Alston remains our awesome college and career specialist for both sites, working mainly with seniors on SRJC registration, financial aid programs, scholarships, and other related activities. 
While seniors are here or her focus, all students have access to her services and she does an excellent job accommodating the needs of her school community. After basically putting our outdoor education outings on hold for the last couple of years, it's been nice getting outside with her classmates for several outings this year. We started this, the year with dual school hike to Tennessee Valley Beach in Marin County, then hiked at Point Reyes, where we had a great ocean view and saw some amazing elk. Last month, both schools took a trip to the Academy of Sciences. For the spring semester, we have trips scheduled for Taylor Mountain Regional Park in Santa Rosa, Jack London State Park in Glen Ellen, and the Golden Gate Bridge. Two students from each schools are participating in the farms program with our teachers, Ms. Delion. The students, along with other teachers and students from surrounding areas, visit local farms and agricultural facilities. The goal is to gain a better understanding of the local agricultural practices being utilized here, right here in Sonoma County. For the students that need a little more credit than what Carpe Diem and Sonoma Mountain can provide, many of our students are utilizing Edgenuity, our online learning platform for credit recovery. We currently have one student co-enrolled in adult school to make up missing credit, while others have utilized Santa Rosa Junior College to make up credits as well as starting working uh, towards their associate degree. Lastly, I would like to add that Carpe Diem has made me feel a lot more confident in my learning ability skills. The help I've received here has been incredibly impactful. Carpe Diem has given me a chance to get my credits in order without having to be stressed out all the time. The small number of students make it easier, make it easier for everyone, including myself, to get the help when it's needed. Finally, I would like to thank my parents for always believing in me and never giving up on me, especially in the moments where I doubted myself. Thank you for your time and thank you for supporting Alternative Education. Stop by our campus, we'd love to see you. Thank you, Emily, that was great. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gary. I'm the president at Kenilworth. I'm excited to share with you what we've been doing around campus. Classes have been busy with projects and fun activities to keep everyone occupied. The past few months have been a breeze for the students with coming back from winter break and starting the new year with a fresh start. To begin, our students share the social life of a beehive, always something going on. Our students enjoy hanging out with their friends and appreciate the campus around them. You can find them in many different places at Kenilworth. Whether playing basketball or reading a book, they are never alone. Our classmates put in a lot of effort during this first week of our second semester. They're working hard to be able to, to, be able to maintain their good grades. We provide help for students who need it too. During lunch and break, multiple classrooms are open and the library is always open for our students. After school, our library is open for students who want to do their homework. Ms. Parnes is in charge of the library and she is always willing to help. Students are participating in hands-on projects that create fun ways to keep the students working together and using their problem solving skills. Some projects we've done so far are the eighth grade egg car challenge where students collaborated with each other to make a protective car that will protect an egg from colliding with a brick. Seventh graders worked on the periodic table and learned about photosynthesis. As well as working on projects, Colts also studied hard to get those great grades during finals week. Kenilworth has the best sports teams. They work very hard to play their best at every game. Did you know that the eighth grade girls basketball team tied for first place? Also, Kenilworth shows their accountability by keeping up with schoolwork while winning their games. All our Colt athletes take pride in their sports and do an amazing job showing the Colt spirit, whether it be on a track, field, or court. Our Kenilworth Colts also show a lot of perseverance in school and in games. Here at KJHS, we have tons of great athletes. On the top right photo, we have Zara Zedler, and on the bottom left, we have Emma Weinzinger. They are both part of the eighth grade girls volleyball team. They stand out because they work hard and demonstrate how a Kenilworth Colt has a strong work ethic. Some of, the, uh, some of the fun things that we do here in Kenilworth is that we do spirit days each Friday. 
It is a day where all the kids in Kenilworth can dress up for that exact day with their friends. It's a fun time wearing some outstanding outfits at a regular school day. It changes up the rhythm of wearing the same type of clothes every day. Some popular spirit days we've had are Pink Day and Tropical Day. Our leadership class loves it, loves it when we see our Colts dress up for spirit days and show their school spirit every Friday. Here at KJHS, at least one Friday of each month, our leadership class hosts Fun Friday. Fun Fridays are activities that all students around campus can participate in. They're small lunchtime games with usually some sort of small prize. Any student is allowed to play the game of that month. When they play the game, we make sure that everyone understands and has fun. Another fun thing that Kenilworth students get to enjoy is our school dances. The neon dance was our first dance that was held indoors since the COVID-19 pandemic. It was decorated with colorful decorations and lights, and people really enjoyed the indoor dance styles. An amazing time was had by all. Our elections for our ASB leaders contained a lot of hard work. Each candidate got two people to help them make posters. Each and every poster was special and unique in its own way. The posters were then hung around the school for all our Kenilworth students to see. The election was positive, fun, and a great learning experience. Kenilworth is continuing to be a place where hardworking and great students are able to participate in fun events and sports. We continue to encourage our students to keep being part of the cult community. We hope that our students can continue to do the best they can. Our school continues to, to be an awesome place for everyone. Go Colts. Go Colts. Thank you. That was great. That's good. Very positive. Yes. I love the energy. Right. Hello, everyone. I am Natty. This is my friend. And I'm Moni, and we're both eighth graders in the leadership of Eluma Junior High. Today, we're going to be talking about some events that have recently happened at Paraluma Junior High and some of the highlights from the fall. The first event that we're going to be highlighting is Spirit Week. Some of the famous um, spirit days that we've had is every, anything but a backpack day or cancer awareness day or class by color. It's, real, it's really fun seeing our bantams get to participate. And if, you, and if they can't participate in one of them, they could participate in the, in the rest of them. Our first rally since COVID was one of my favorite events that happened in Petaluma Junior High. Some of the games, it was designed by students from leadership and some of the games were horse race or, sorry, uh, horse race was one of my favorite games, including the seventh graders and eighth graders and one of our teachers there, Mr. Griffin. As you can see, he was racing one of our seventh graders and at the end, the seventh grader won. And it was just so much fun watching and seeing who won and seeing such school spirit. Another event is the Halloween slash Dia de los Muertos dance. This was the first time that we've ever combined two holidays in one dance. The reason we combined was for all our bantams to be able to go to the dance. The reason why is because either some students could celebrate Halloween, but not Dia de los Muertos, or could celebrate Dia de los Muertos, but not Halloween. This was a way for all our bantams to be able to go to the dance and participate. Our library reopens. It was in the first semester, it was difficult because the library was closed. And so I couldn't get any studying time or I couldn't get a book. But in November, Ms. Thompson was hired. It was a retired CASA librarian. The library is now open and is great for getting materials and a quiet place to study for.
Another fun event that happened was the seventh grade science students got to go, to, had the unique opportunity to go visit the Lazy R Ranch in Tamales in order to learn from our local conversations. This was a really unique opportunity for them because neither of us had the opportunity to able to be able to learn from real life experiences because we got to learn from notes and and textbooks and slideshows, but they actually had to go out there and get their hands dirty and stuff like that. Can you play the video, please? Thank you. Holocaust speaker, an element with many of our eighth graders reading the diary of a young girl by Anna Frank, English teacher Miss Montuani arranged for a very special speaker to be on campus in December, Gloria Glickman. Mrs. Glickman is a Holocaust de descendant whose parents were in concentration camps in Germany from 1944-1945. Mrs. Glickman was born in a displaced person camp in German in 1946 and immigrated with her parents to New York in 1949. This helped our students learn more about the Holocaust because they actually had a firsthand experience person that experienced the Holocaust and could ask questions about the person that experienced the Holocaust. Another event was a collab with Petaluma Junior High and the Petaluma High School, where current basketball players and leadership students partnered with Special Olympics and special needs students at both schools to practice basketball, establish friendships, and have fun in the court. They capped off their time together by playing an inclusive game during halftime at Petaluma High School. Athletics in full swing. Fall, some of the uh, sports that happen in fall were cross, cross country, girls basketball, boys basketball, girls volleyball. I played for the girls, girls basketball and playing in that team made me closer to them and have a, have a relationship with all my teammates. And I am a helper with the boys basketball. And I feel like PJ chess and learning the sports that we have really can help you in high school if you want to participate in those sports. Our B Bantam raffle. Our B Bantam program was a huge success this fall. Teachers and staff gave tickets to students who demonstrated the positive characteristics we're looking for in our students. Some of these characteristics include B for Brave, A for authentic, N for neighborly, T for trustworthy, A for accepting, and M for mindful. Our ultimate bantams. Seventh grader Nolan White earned the most tickets during the fall and won a special prize basket. Mrs. Garvey, Mrs. Thompson, and Mrs. Q gave out the most tickets during the fall and also won a special prize box from Petaluma Coffee and Tea. As a school, we've been visiting elementary school, holding tours, and having a sixth grade parent. I was part of the school 
panel that gave sixth grade parents an insight into students' life here at Petaluma Junior High School. And most importantly, we have fun. One of my favorite events was being participating in the sports and being connected with the principal and the vice principal. Also hanging out with my friends is a really big part of being in PJHS. Um, one of my favorite parts was being part of leadership. I wasn't part of leadership last year and I truly do regret that because I really like taking pictures of, dan of the dances or setting up for the dances or just helping out a fellow Bantam when needed. Um, I also like filming our Bantam broadcast, which is a little show that we have that goes up every few weeks. Our future is bright. This picture was taken after many, many days it was raining. And here we have our nice campus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, those were great presentations. All three of them, yeah. All right, next up, Bond Citizens Oversight Committee annual report. Are you gonna intro this, Chris? Yes, absolutely, thank you. So um, we have two members of our Bond Oversight Committee in attendance here. We have Jerry Matasha and Michael Webb. And so um, tonight we have on the agenda, the annual report that we're bringing forward to you. Um, we um, had some challenges in the past couple of years, just trying to have meetings because of the pandemic and moving to a virtual environment, et cetera. But we were able to um, have two meetings and, and, um, two and present to you this annual report. If you turn to the last page, you'll see the conclusion, which is based on the foregoing review of expenditures and other activities. The oversight committee con concludes that the bond proceeds spent to date have only been part have only been spent for the construction, reconstruction, rehabilitation, or replacement of school facilities, including furnishing and equipping of schools, facilities, or acquisition, et cetera. This is all in compliance with the language of the two bond measures that we've had. Um, there are also exhibits and attachments, including the bond, um, the bond performance and financial audits, which the committee had a chance to review. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of detail in the annual report itself, just kind of about the measures. And there's a long list of um, specific projects that we've worked on, projects that um, were, we finished up and, and future projects that we're contemplating. So um, I'm happy to report that I think that we're doing well. And I wanna just give an opportunity to either of our two members to add any thoughts or comments on our annual report. Yeah, we've met a couple of times, everything looks good. You know, there's a lot of good projects going on, like painting, different upgrades and things that we've seen. So very happy to see that and see the campuses, you know, all of them working that they need so the students have what they need. Yeah, it was um, uh, quite impressive the number of projects that have actually been undertaken. Uh, lovely to see um, uh, the whole infrastructure of the um, uh, school district uh, being. Uh, uh, augmented in this way. Uh, we have the opportunity of uh, looking at the uh, spreadsheet of the, the expenses and the budget for the different items. And um, we also had the opportunity to review one or two of these projects. And you see there's quite a large number of them in a lot more detail. And um, it was uh, very, very impressive to see it. Very happy to be part of the group um, ensuring that that bond money is uh, appropriately budgeted. Hopefully, now that the pandemic is moving into a different phase, we'd love to get the bond oversight committee out, maybe on one of our new electric buses and take a tour. That that was one of the requests that had been made, but was super challenging to do the last couple of years. So I'm hopeful that maybe this spring we can get out and, and, and take more physical. We lose, use some Google map to kind of go down and show them. Um, some of the work that we were doing. I also just want to um, 
let you know who the current members are. We have our two members um, who are in, in attendance here. We have Tim Shaley, Alice Christensen, who's been part of the bond measure from the very beginning, and Phoebe Ellis. We just wanna acknowledge our current members and the work they do, it's super important. And I also would like to take an opportunity to, to mention some of our past members. Um, Scott Pritchard, who was a chairperson for many years, he did a, a really great job and provided leadership. Elizabeth Marquette, um, who, or Marquardt, excuse me, who was on the bond oversight from, for a very long time and did took a very active role in getting the bond passed. Mimi Knopp, Thomas Donahue, and Patience Patchett. So these are just a few of the members that um, were on the past committee that we're now looking at, we've had a few new members join and, and we're actually actively looking for additional members if possible. So anyway, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge their hard work super important for us to be able to have them to show the work that we're completing and, and just give the community some assurances that we're following the measure, the language of the measures, and that hopefully we're doing a really good job investing those dollars into our facilities. Any questions? Thanks for your work. Uh, it was really gratifying to see that long list of things that are on it. Um, you know, most of those things, maybe all of those things on there, uh, in my opinion, aren't um, aren't luxuries. They're things that you know have to be done for this to work, and uh, which leads me to ask. Um, I, I think we just uh, authorized our la our final sale for our bonds uh, this past year, which means we're going to be running out <laughs> soon. And these are uh, you know expenditures that are. Uh, continuing, we're, we're gonna need that kind of uh, capital uh, improvement uh, budget. So the question is, when should we be thinking about uh, a scope for the next bond issue or next bond ballot issue? I think it's a great question. Honestly, um, what we've learned in the past two years with the pandemic is that ventilation has gone from here to up here in order of priority. It was always important but as we have evaluated our ventilation systems, um, and you'll notice a lot of these projects have moved toward upgrading ventilation systems, that's become super important. I mean, I'm looking at ventilation systems that we've installed in the 90s, maybe 2002, 2003, and that's now 20 years old, if you can believe it. So there's a lot of need, and you're right, we just sold 5 million in the elementary, um, we sold about 20 million in the secondary, our, our high school district, um, and I can assure you that the need far exceeds the capacity of the bond measures. I mean, we had 68 million for the secondary and 26 million for the elementary. And although I think we've really leveraged the pandemic and gotten a lot of really good pricing on some of these projects, um, there still is a significant need. And so I would, I would say that probably in the next year, starting to take a look at um, bonding capacity, maybe bringing in, doing some polling, um, and maybe even hiring an architectural firm to do a needs assessment might be a really good place to start to kind of share with the community. This is where our needs are from a, from a, you know, I have my seat. I can see where I believe our needs are, but having a, um, a more independent person come in and assess that need by district might be a really good place to start. And it might also help and quantify what that need is. So yes. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I'm just trying to think about the timeline because you know we need a, a large um, head start to get things on a ballot, say in 24 or something like that. And so, you know, how much time does the last sale buy us in terms of covering what we need to cover in capital improvement projects or maintenance? Or going out? Yeah, I mean, you probably want to start now with doing some of the planning and anticipating. Usually it's an off year, you know, there's lots of conversations that we can have. We can kind of map out some next steps and a timeline if that would be helpful. Um, because I do think starting to have the conversation now, I mean, we were actually going down the path back in 2019 of having conversations about, you know, a performance hall and all kinds of improvements. You're right. This is the basic. This is, as I say, we just try to, we're just trying to stabilize the infrastructure, making sure we have solid roofs, exterior paint, good mechanical systems, um, good sewer lines. I mean, our, our student restrooms, you know, I look around and they could easily use an upgrade in most of our student restrooms. We just recently in-house renovated a restroom at Cherry Valley mostly doing it in-house and it came out beautiful, but 
it was because it was a modular building that we could easily do that in. So there is a, a, a tremendous need and we can kind of map out what that might look like and what a target election date that might look like. But there is a lot of steps and some of which can be done simultaneously. simultaneously. Anyone else? Questions? Yeah, thank you. Thank you both for serving on this oversight committee. Oh, yeah. Um, we'll take like a two minute break to excuse our wonderful student presenters. Thank you for coming. All right. Education members and in Harris community staff um, for having student services here this evening. Thank you for the opportunity. Good. I'm really excited about the work that student services is doing. And I really want to thank the board and Superintendent Harris for setting the goal and the directions to make this work possible. Um, I believe student services is working towards being a very inclusive and restorative department. So I'm very, very grateful for that opportunity. Also, we do have a lot more work to do, um, but I think we're moving in a really positive direction. And tonight is meant to be just kind of a broad overview. If there are things that you have questions about and want more information about, I'm happy to come back at another time, but this is just kind of a, giving you the landscape. And I had a little coaching session with Dave earlier, so let's hope it all goes well. <laughs> okay, so I really want to acknowledge the team. Um, these are some, Petaluma City Schools has some amazing employees. And that right there is a really good example. Those guidance coordinators and nurses, they are here to make sure that the student experience is a positive one. They care very, very deeply about the students in this school district. Um, we recently added Lisa Manthe and Monica Carvalho to the team. Uh, Lisa started last year and Monica started this year as one of the nurses. Jimena Gomez has been um, exceptional in her work. And Jennifer Ortiz is new. She's the new administrative assistant and um, very, very happy to have her. And then Judy Kailaros works with our unsheltered youth. So just, I really want to just point out how outstanding these folks are. So, I've been looking at um, student services and really I kind of narrowed it down to the ABCs. It seems very uh, juvenile, but it, it, it worked in my head anyway. Um, attendance is how we sh is showing up. And that's a big part of this work is showing up, how the adults show up, how the students show up. And the other part of it is how we show up. What's our behavior when we're showing up? How, pardon me? <laughs> I mean, where, how do we, how do we interact with one another, with our communities, and then the community piece is the support we need to be the best that we can be. And all of that really centers around wellness, I think, helps support the wellness, the physical and mental health of our students in our community so that they can be academically successful. Really, student services is to support the academic success of our students and that they can show up and be the best that they can be. It's not just about discipline, so I just... And I'm grateful for that. I also look at it as uh, I also look at it. It's the climate and climate, culture, and safety. It's the water we swim in every day. Student services is the culture that's developed. It's the welcoming. It's the sense of belonging. It's that you matter in our community, um, and really instilling that in um, for our communities, our students, our staff, um, and just it. It it's it is the water we swim in every day. So. Um, I just, I tried to put as concisely as possible some of the things that student services is currently responsible for um, and some of the things that we're working. As I mentioned, climate, culture, and safety, our comprehensive school plans, uh, PBIS, restorative practice, and then of course, student discipline. The community outreach that's taking place, uh, we've developed several community, um, or community groups and these include parents, staff, uh, our community-based organizations. Um, there's the Healthy Choice Committee that 
uh, started around substance prevention. Our equity team, which was responsible for identifying a new equity provider and also monitoring the work of that provider. The safety committee is looking at our safety in our entire community, uh, what the district responsibility is, what the site responsibility is, and how we interact with our community organizations. And then we have the LGBTQIA plus advisory group. Um, our next step, we've been meeting for the last few months and our next step in that group is to meet with our GSA um, teams and identify what kind of support they might be needing to help with their mission. The well-being is our mental health, our LMFTs, our nursing team. We're responsible for the 504 plans. Care Solace is a new tool in our tool belt, um, thanks to the folks who are sitting behind me. Um, they, uh, we, we can do warm handoffs to service providers. The limitation is the number of service providers that are available. Um, and then of course, our friend COVID. Um, student rights, we have Title IX, Title VI, and LGBTQIA plus rights. And then we do a lot of work with attendance. We support the SART teams at the school sites. We run um, SARB hearings. We also are independent study, inter and intra district transfers, enrollment, and then add adult education and athletics on that too. So a little bit of everything, which it keeps it interesting. Um, I wanted to give you a little bit of an update on the work that First Water and uh, our uh, PBIS uh, coach has been working with. First Water has been to, I think, three leadership team meetings now. They've been working with us in, in identifying our biases, our power and our privilege as leaders. One of the questions that has come up is how is this affecting students? And I actually had to write this down because I really thought long and hard about this. And as I've reflected on this question, and I think it's that we have to be courageous as the adults, we have to examine our beliefs and our practices and how our bias shows up and how we interact with people on a daily basis. And when we can recognize that and begin to interrogate it, then the student experience is gonna be different because we will be different. So I think that's, that is, that's the reason in working with the leadership and the adults in the rooms because we have to change the way we look at things. I told a story about my son the other day. It doesn't matter what my mouth says. It's the look on my face that has that, that he's like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, and he's an adult. So, um, so it's, Im it's important. It's important that we're interrogating how we show up. And I think that's what First Water is providing for us. They are doing staff interviews to kind of get a sense of what the staff experience is. And they're providing administrative coaching and all the administrators are doing 360 surveys to kind of get that sense of how our people are experiencing us. Our um, PBIS coaching, we've had on-site coaching in August and April. Uh, there's been two days with each of the climate and culture teams. There's a video series that the staff has been doing, although finding time for that has been a challenge. We have circle training for teachers in February, and then the administrative team and our um, anyone who's really outside the classroom is going to get a higher level of restorative practice training. They're going to get certified, so uh, they'll be able. It's a little bit of the train of the trainers model, but they'll have a higher level of certification. Um, Oh, in addition, I wanted to mention that we recently received a $200,000 grant from the CDE to help pay for the equity training um, so that we don't have it yet, but we're on the list. So we're very excited about that. So I wanted to talk a little bit about attendance. Um, kids are not showing up after the pandemic. Many are decided for a number of reasons not to show up. Uh, and we had, I found this really striking that um, in the 2021, at least 10 million students nationwide were absent. Um, and then COVID has just exacerbated that number. So I wanted to talk about the difference between chronic absence and truancy because those are two very different things that people get often confused on. Truancy is being unexcused. It's three or more absences unexcused. Chronic absence is, it can be excused, it can be unexcused, but it's 10% of the school year. So if there are 100 days and you've missed 10, you're considered chronically absent. Um, 
we have about 262 students in PCS that are considered chronically absent. So we sent out letters at the beginning, uh, right before the holidays, just informing families, offering support. We've done some data collection and some analysis about why they're absent, what are some of the reasons, and now we're going to do, we're going to meet with some of these parents who are willing to meet with us and have conversations with them about why they're not showing up and what kind of support, what kind of community resources do we have? Because I think this is this is such a big piece of what we do. If they're not here, we're, our success is going to be limited. So um, I'm gonna to touch on this briefly. This is our positive, you've seen this a number of times. We're really working in the tier one area, um, supporting the school sites. And one of the things that has come up a, a number of times is that PBIS is we are now we're soft on discipline. Well, PBIS is not discipline. PBIS is setting expectations. So I just want to clarify that for folks. It's about what we expect, how we enforce that, and um, or encourage that, and um, and that's helping everyone understand that. And then restorative practices is a way of restoring. Suspension is still a tool in our tool belt, but it's not the first tool we go to. Um, again, I just wanted to mention the teams that we've been working with, um, and I'm just really proud of the work that these folks are doing. The Healthy Choice Committee um, identified three goals of uh, identifying curriculum, uh, advocating for team space, and alternatives to suspension, and we're working those three goals. The Safety Committee, again, working on the plans. Um, LGBTQI plus working to um, understand the student experience a little better. Um, this is, if you come to the safety committee, you'll see this, this is a draft of kind of the flow chart. We're working in four areas of wellness and prevention, preparedness, response and recovery, and some of the things that work in each of those areas and how areas that we need some support in, areas that we're rocking it and trying to um, better establish our safety plans so that they're not words on a page, that they're actually actionable. Um, some of the work that, uh, we've been doing, and I'm going to see if I can get to this site without completely blowing this, but this is, um, we have, we've been creating some Google sites, which um, will eventually transfer to our websites, but for right now, they're living in the Google world. And so this is a, the one, this is the safety planning site that those are on safety committee. Um, we'll see this, but we're building a site that has resources for our school sites and our community. Um, there are our local safety committees, our local and state and national, what our school resources are. And each of these has a link to resources and opportunities that um, our sites can use. And then at the bottom, there are a number of resources for um, families in crisis. So we're trying to make this more available to folks. Okay, let's see if I can. Um, the nurses have created a site and um, we also have what we're calling a calming space that um, we're piloting at Mary Collins right now, which is a place that has animal videos, coloring pages, exercise that you can use at home and to help regulate. So just trying to create some more resources and tools for families and staff. And I think I just wanted to finally touch on the impact and the outcomes. So as we're building these different programs and opportunities, we're looking at things like attendance, referrals, suspensions, the demographics of who we're suspending, um, the demographics of who's not showing up. Um, many of the SARB hearings that are conducted are of a certain demographic. So how, what are we doing to, um, to change that? So those are the outcomes that those are the outcomes that we're currently looking at, and we'll we will continue to develop that because we want to make sure that the work that we're doing is having an impact on the student experience. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Are there any questions? I just want to say thank you. Um, I just really appreciate how so many folks on your team come to all of your the different committees. I didn't realize that the safety and the um, healthy choices were like kind of birthed from the student services. So that's amazing. I know we were both on that one and it's great to see, um, yeah, so many MFTs and your people there. I did just have one question on the draft. 
um, yeah. under recovery, it says anniversary. What's, what is that? So one of the things that people often forget is the anniversary of an event mm -hmm. and that you need to plan for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> this is wonderful. Um, I love how you're changing the focus and, um, you know, really taking such a holistic and compassionate look at student services and our students in general. Um, but I did have a question about um, kind of uh, how much collaboration there is with, you know, like uh, I've been on CHIPA for many years. They're all healthcare providers in the Petaluma area or in Sonoma County, at least. I was just wondering, what kind of collaboration there is between us? I mean, is there follow up afterwards? Is there some way, or is there movement towards um, uh, collaborating more, or is that necessary? You know, they have providers, yeah. but I mean, it just, I'm just kind of curious um, because it's such a dynamic group. Yeah. And I'm wondering how it's used, basically, here yeah. in the district. Um, thank you. Um, Jimena has been attending some of the CHIPA meetings. Um, and then we have um, our health district and our health center. Uh, we're collaborating with them on a number of initiatives. We're run, we've run a couple of immunization clinics in collaboration with them to bring down our get more of our students immunized. We also, uh, Ramona and... Um, Elise sit on the safety committee as well. So there is there is collaboration. There's always more opportunity to collaborate. And now that I feel like I've got my feet on the ground a little better, I can start to work more of those opportunities. But I think we are, um, Jimena has been representing student services pretty well in our community. Um, but there are there is representation on our committees from our CBOs. Did that answer? Anyone else? Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, Maite. Thank you. I wanted to ask about the 262 students that are chronically absent. Do we have a sense of, is that an increase from pre-pandemic? Pre I'm wondering if COVID had a big, you know, yeah. say in that because one, in, one infection can account for like seven to 10 days, couldn't it? Yeah. Yes. And I believe that there is, I don't have the exact number, but I do believe that it is an increase in one of, and illness is a big part of it or right. quarantining or those other things that have happened as a result of COVID. But COVID also had an impact on our kids. It's like, oh, I can, I can stay home. Right. And so um, there's, I think we have a lot to recover from um, as a result of that. And this is one of the reasons we want to meet with families is to kind of start to gather some information about what is actually happening for them. I believe a lot of it is anxiety and depression that's taking place for a lot of our kiddos. And um, so we want to gather some more information before we start finding a solution. We don't want to, we don't want to make it worse. Um, you mentioned when you were talking about SARB um, that it's you're trying to get a hold of parents that are willing to come talk. I thought if a kid's SARB, the parents have to show up. So those are so SARB, yes, you do you have to, right? There are some consequences if you don't. The other is voluntary meetings we're having with families who might need additional support, right? And we have had two mediations with the DA this year that they've come here and they they have been pretty supportive and they come up with some opportunities options and some opportunities that we don't have access to. So we've, we have taken two students to the district attorney this year. Chronic absenteeism. Yeah, thank you. Mia and Alan, do you guys have any questions or anything you wanna add, anything? Anything. Mia has been coming to our safety meetings and she was on our panel in December. So it was really nice to have her there and have the student voice. So I appreciate that, thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> PEF Impact Grant Award. So it's my my pleasure to to welcome uh, Maureen Highland, the executive director of PEF. 
And I'm not sure, are you, are you bringing Ramona with you? Ramona, Ramona Faith here, the C CEO of the Petaluma Healthcare District. Um, they're here to present an award directly to you know, our district team, wrote, uh, wrote one, as well as just explain a little bit about some of the awards that went out this year. Um, good evening. Happy New Year. It's been a while since we've ooh, been in person. So thank you. Um, I sit on the other side of the wall. For those of you who don't know, I'm Maureen Island with the Educational Foundation here at PEF. We serve all our schools in the community. So 38 TK through 12 public, private, and charter, of which your district your two districts are the majority of those schools. So we are very proud of the 40 year history and legacy of working together and supporting student learning. So with that, um, I wanted to announce that at, as of right now, we have awarded over $8.7 million in scholarships and grants as we end our 40th anniversary year. So we're very, very proud to have that as our legacy. We could not do that without the members in our community and business partners that stand up and support us financially. And then the um, collaboration with school districts, administrators, educators, and everyone else in between. So thank you as well for making all this possible. Um, I do wanna note that Petaluma City Schools, the two different districts, so you have the elementary and secondary, you have received over $2.3 million of the grant money that we have awarded in an additional $200,000 that were spread over grants that served all the schools in the community. So you have um, shared in quite a bit of the resources and that is an exciting thing to see as we go forward into the next decade of services with PEF. So um, with that, we are here to present uh, Maite and her team with an award, a grant award from this year, which I will say, this is the highest amount of grants we've ever awarded in the 40 year history following last year's April uh, scholarships award, which was the highest amount of scholarships we've ever given in our history. So we are very excited. And with that, I wanna invite Ramona Faith, who is the um, CEO of the Petaluma Healthcare District. PEF has annual partners. We have Color Sonoma, we have Exchange Bank, Petaluma Market and Petaluma Healthcare District that work with us all year round. With their partner funding, we are here to present you with your grant award for Care Solace. Thank you. You have ten thousand dollars to help with student services. Thank you. Absolutely. So we have been visiting all the schools that got grants and delivering banners. So you've seen that on social media and us around town. Katie Berkey, our program director, has been out visiting. So we have been awarding everything that the students refer to tonight. The journalism class at Petaluma High received a grant. Kenworth has received grant. CASA received grant. You were one of the presenters. So um, this is just one of the grants, but this is considered a district grant. So that is why we came here to present to you all this evening. So congratulations. You. Congratulations. Is there anything you'd like to share? Um, what I'd like to share. Well, uh, the health and well-being of the students are very important to the Petaluma Healthcare District. Um, you know, we serve South County. We serve about eighty-five thousand residents, and and schools are a focus. Um, there's uh, a lot of need in the schools, I know. And uh, to your uh, question, Maddie, uh, we're actually at a point where where she calls me and says, "I need your help." So that's a good thing, right? So uh, we we do work we do work uh, well together, and there there are so many more opportunities to work to do even more together. So um, I think the biggest challenge we have is everyone's so busy and just trying to make sure we can connect and get together. But the health and well-being of our students is one of our strategic priorities, and the families, right? So I think that um, you know what everybody's experiencing is we're still we're still in the muck. We're still we're still impacted by COVID. I mean, we, there's, it still exists and we're gonna have the impact for, for, for a very long time. So um, I look forward to working with not just the Petaluma City Schools, but all the schools in Petaluma to see what we can do to help support 
the families and the, and the teachers in helping to create a health and safety uh, safe work environment, because without that, we can't learn. So thank you so much. And thank you for everything you do. I will come back and visit you um, after April 19th. We will be awarding our scholarships uh, at a reception then. So please, you're all invited. You do receive an invitation additionally, but please join us and I will come back and present so publicly people can hear um, the awards for this year. Scholarship reception, uh, uh, April 19th. And it'll be at Petaluma High this year. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So I'll go ahead and leave some brochures from last year's grant awards and then just our informational sheet. But thank you very much. And we look forward to continuing working all together. What are we doing? I'll catch you if you fall in. <laughs> Holding my breath, it's fine. <laughs> All right. Oh, that's perfect. All right. Nice. All right. Take your time. In a little bit, Mason. Okay, ready? One, two, three. And on three, say thank you. Thank you. And on three, say we love PES. We love PES. <laughs> and we love Ramona. <laughs> All right, Chris Thomas, <laughs> you're, up. you're up. Why is it I always follow the more fun stuff? No one, no one invites me up here to take pictures. Seriously. Okay, so I'm going to pass out just because I know there are those of us who might not have the youngest eyes. It makes it harder. It's easier to see on paper. And what's a little ironic is Chris and I are going to the governor's budget for budget um, meeting tomorrow, but we're just going to present before we go. Okay. Yeah. Be, uh, yes. I'm going to give you as much details as we know right now. So it's a little bit higher level because it's what I could really glean from what has already been put out there because we don't have our fancy slides on the state economy and everything else. Um, but I do think that this will be helpful, hopefully, to give you an idea of of what Matthew and I are going to get more detail on tomorrow. So anyway, whoops. Are you doing it or am I doing it? Okay, yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so here are some key points that um, in looking at the, the governor's state budget proposal that we can kind of take away. This is a 297 billion state budget. I mean, that struck me maybe because I've been in education for too long. I remember when it was like 140 billion and that was like, you know, big, but 297 billion, that's a lot of money for the state of California. And remember, California is like the fifth largest or the seventh largest, not the fifth largest in the world. Right, so <clears throat> this kind of highlights that in, 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 real, in real dollars. So um, of that, about 108.8 billion, just under 109 billion in Prop 98 funding. 
And one of the things that I thought was of note is that this is 1.5 billion less than in the 2023 budget. So remember, we got a lot of one-time money. We had the augmentation, you know, so we, 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 we received a lot of money in 2022, 23. And although this is a very positive state budget for us moving forward into 23, 24, it is 1.5 billion less than what he proposed or what we received this year. That said, the cost of living adjustment or the COLA as we know it is estimated at 8.13. And I say it's estimated because the Department of Finance right now who works for the governor, so there's the legislative analyst office at the state level, there's the Department of Finance, those are Governor Newsom's people, <clears throat> and then there's UCLA. And so all three of them kind of work their magic to say where they think that the COLA is gonna be when the state finally collects its final revenues in April and then comes out with a statutory goal in May. So right now, the Department of Finance is estimating that at 8.13%. That's significant. I don't think in my career dating back to the 90s that I've seen a COLA this large, an actual COLA, not an augmented COLA, not a super COLA, an actual cost of living adjustment. Um, and the good news is in his budget proposal, he's, he's not only projecting this for the LCFF, but also for special education funding. And so special education funding does not flow directly to districts. It goes to our SELPA or our special education local plan area. And so we don't know what that will look like at the end of the day for us, but still seeing special education get a larger piece of the pie is a good thing. Over the past decades, the governor and the state have not always put the coal on special education funding. So anyway, I just wanted to say that's that of note for us. Uh, his budget proposal also includes ongoing funding for TK expansion, but from everything I could read, it looks like it's maintaining the 12 to one adult to student ratio. Now we're a long way away from a final budget, but, but at least in his first proposal, um, he is funding it. So the state is moving from a February 2nd to an April 2nd date. And he is putting funding behind that because they're estimating like 36,000 more students just from that, that two month window across the state, of course. Um, and so he is putting money behind funding that implementation. That's a good thing. Um, he's also fun looking at an ongoing commitment to fund 60% of the proof cost for home to school transportation. And so if you, you may or may not recall, it was kind of more of a footnote, if you will, in last year's budget for this year. And that was that they were looking at funding home to school transportation. They were gonna go back to all of our LCFF calculations. Cause remember back in 2012, 13, when they created the LCFF, they rolled all of our categoricals or a large number of our cat, like 36 categoricals, they rolled into the LCFF. And that included home to school transportation and special education transportation, which used to be two relatively large grants. It's also important to note that they had chopped that through the Great Recession by 80%, by 20%. So they only rolled 80% of those historic grants into our LCFF at the time. So now what they're doing is they're actually coming in, taking a look at what is that amount of money that we're receiving? What are the total costs of transportation? And then actually providing some level of augmentation for that to bring the funding up to 60%. I don't know what that's gonna exactly look like, but he does have this also ongoing in, in this year's budget proposal. <clears throat> it's interesting because basically he needs to figure out a way to fund all of this. And so one of the items he included in the budget proposal was to actually cut the art, music, instructional materials, discretionary block grant. I apologize, there should be a comment up there by about 1.2 billion. And I think that's about a third by my estimation. So. He proposed and we received in the state budget about 4.4 million for Petaluma City Schools based on this year's budget. And he's now proposing taking 1.2 billion or an equivalent about a third away from districts, not funding that, lowering the per pupil rate to help fund some of these things that he's proposing. Um, Um, he's also proposing ongoing ELOP, that's that extended learning opportunity program, not the COVID one, but the new permanent one, ongoing state funding at our current level. For Petaluma, it's about 1.7 million per year. He's got funding to continue that. 
Um, he's also looking at continuing state funding for the universal meal program. So that's where all students can eat for free, regardless of their socioeconomic status. Um, that includes two meals for every student. Um, but he's also not inclu including any kind of cost of living increase in that per meal funding amount. So again, consider 8% inflation and food costs. Anybody who's gone to the grocery store, it's just shocking how much eggs are, how much milk is, how much bread is. Um, so he's not proposing any increase in the funding for that program, just a continuation of the existing rates per meal. Um, he's also looking at a couple other things that I don't believe we're gonna really benefit from. He's looking at an LCFF equity multiplier to the base. And again, we'll get more details tomorrow what that might look like. But when I read up on it, it looks like it's only for high poverty schools. Now, it didn't say high poverty districts. So whether that would then apl be applied somehow to a school within a district that's not high poverty, I'm not really sure. So tomorrow at the, at the workshop, we're hoping to get a little more detail about that. So it could apply. You know, we have three schools that are over 40%, McDowell, McKinley, and Valley Vista, and of course, Kenilworth. And so it could apply, but I'm not sure how in practicality they would do that. So we'll, we'll wait and see. There's also 250 million to increase access to literacy staff. But again, those are for only schools in high poverty areas at which Petaluma would not be considered one. There's 3.5 million in funding to provide schools with fentanyl overdose medication. So this is something that easily could affect student services and the nursing staff and our school sites in particular. So hopefully there'll be more information out on that. And then not to leave Dave out, 20, 28.7 million proposed for cybersecurity. So that's gonna be interesting to see because um, we know that that's a large topic right now. Okay, what's next? So I know, again, I'm not doing all this, the pie charts and bar graphs and fancy because we don't have those yet. I tried downloading them before, before the meeting tonight and I, I couldn't get access. But just to kind of sum up, like what are our next step? What's the state next step? Because the state has a budget process and we're kind of now at the beginning. January 10th is the beginning of that budget process for the state where the governor comes out with his or her budget proposal as a starting place. We, we really use it as a roadmap for how we start our budget process. The legislature will now begin to work on the on budget proposals and committee. And so they're gonna be haggling back and forth. And there's a lot of back and forth between the administration and both houses. Um, and it's important to no note that leadership in both houses have actually declared support for protecting education funding. So they wanna protect those investments in education. So that's a good thing because there's a lot of competing, a lot of competing interest on the state funding um, and, a lo and a lot of high need interest. I mean, these are, these are not fluff items. These are things like Medicare and Medi-Cal, I should say, and funding for at-risk programs. And so we wanna see that protection to a certain extent for education. Now, there will be a lot more detail coming out in the X number of weeks through the form of trailer bills in which the governor will start providing or the Department of Finance will, and the governor's staff will start providing more detail about what some of the stuff is going to look like. Um, and then, of course, we're looking forward to the May revise. The governor will come out with his May revise to this proposal, uh, May 15th or 14th, 15th. Um, and then at that time, we'll know what the final statutory goal is. Then we know that there's going to be a lot of negotiations between the governor and the state legislature. And, you know, we know that about eight to 10 years ago, it changed. And there, there's now this new Jan, June 15th deadline for the legislature to pass the state budget bill and present it to the governor. And we've had an on-time budget ever since. And um, for those of us who track this stuff. There were many, many, many years where we didn't have a state budget till the end of July, August. I've even seen it as late as September. And trying to operate a district budget when you have no idea how much money you're going to get was challenging. So we're grateful for this June 15th. So they have to finish their process and pass a state budget bill and present it to the governor. In the meantime, we have to present to you guys, the board, 
a, a, a budget for the district around the first part of June, and you guys have to have it approved no later than June 30th and submitted to the County Office of Education. And then after that, the final state budget act will get signed into law by the governor. And that has to happen by July 1st. And then we'll come back and we'll, if there's anything significant, which this, this year was an extreme example of a significant change from the May revise to the final state budget, we'll disclose the impacts of any significant changes. So that's kind of our process and the state's process. Our next steps are, we're really gonna be working on gathering more information. So we are now going into budget development phase, starting with really working with our principals on projecting what our enrollment's gonna be next year. Taking a look at cohort projections where every kindergartner becomes a first grader and every first grader becomes a second grader, doing some attrition rates in between grade levels as we, as we see from trends and working with our principals to really project TK enrollment and kinder enrollment because that becomes the big question mark for someone like me. How, how many kinders and TK students are gonna enroll? From there, and I think Maite highlighted this really, um, really adequately in her presentation about our ADA, trying to project ADA attendance in this environment has become extremely challenging because of the impacts of the pandemic. Um, and, and I think Maite did a great job really outlining kind of what's creating that attendance challenge for our students and for our families. And it's really wreaking havoc. We just completed our, our P1 ADA and it's significantly down where I was projecting it for this year. So our enrollment is down, but our attendance is down even lower. So really taking a deeper dive into what that's gonna look like on a three-year average basis. And then working with HR and doing staffing projections, how are we gonna staff based on where we think our enrollment's gonna be? Um, and then we've got COVID funding. We've got a, we had about 22 plus million dollars in COVID funding over the past two, two and a half years. We have a lot of positions tied to that funding. Most of it had to be spent by, well, a chunk of it had to be spent by 2023, August. And there's a, a remaining portion that we had until 24, but probably about a third, 20, 25% to a third of that money is, is left for 23, 24. So, you know, we're gonna, we're taking a, a hard look at, what positions are supported by COVID and, and really um, looking at uh, um, reductions in force, both for classified and certificated as we move forward, because we're gonna have to have a process to prioritize, but we don't have the time from a state timeline perspective. We have to, we have to look at February for a particular kind of service layoff. We have to look at February now for a RIF because the state came in and changed the law and now we have to give classified staff a March 15th notice as well. So we're working on um, pulling that information together and, and coming back to you. So that's gonna be a part of our, our process. So of course, there's lots more information that's gonna come out as just as far as um, gathering that information, but those are some of the key things, the starting place that we're gonna begin with. So questions? I, um, I had read some commentaries on the proposal from EdSource and CSBA, and they were kind of characterizing it as a drop, you know, a, a cut, like you note here, but not proportional to projected drops in enrollment is, was what I read. And so they were kind of giving it a positive spin. I don't know how you, <laughs> you make that a positive spin, but that's what they were trying to do. Um, I also wanted to note to my fellow board members that CSBA is going to have their, uh, related to this, CSBA is going to have their um, state uh, legislative advocacy days, March 14th and 16th. I would love Alan and Mia to join us on this because I, uh, I don't think I've ever seen student uh, reps on this legislative days, and I think you guys would be really effective. It's a day, it's two days where we meet with the state legislators, the senators and assembly people to let them know about um, the needs of our local school districts and advocating for our schools. Yeah, 14th to 16th, that's right. Well, it's the crop. 
it's across three days. So I think they're going to phase in. It's going to, it's going to be virtual. It's not going to, we're not going to go to second. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be virtual. You're not going to get onto an electric bus and drive to second. <laughs> no. That would have been awesome. I don't know. Those bus seats aren't really designed to sit in for an hour and a half. The, uh, Sheldon, to your point, I wanted to mention when you dive into the detail of the governor's budget proposal, he's actually, it looks to me, my read on it was leveraging savings because of the drop of enrollment in order to fund some of this. So he's, he, I should say the state, it's really the Department of Finance, they're looking at, they understand that there's a drop in enrollment, a drop in attendance, and they're actually leveraging savings in not having to fund that level of attendance to fund some of these other things. So they're actually commenting on those lower attendance rates and enrollment. Other questions? I mean, I, I don't wanna paint, I mean, it's a good solid budget. Like I said, 8%. I think it's also very, very um, indicative of the inflation we've seen because inflation plays a huge part in it. So it sounds like, wow, 8%, that's a lot of money, but the cost of doing business for us has dramatically changed. There's no doubt. And I know that our principals are feeling it in a very significant way. I've had conversations with many of them, especially the elementary principals that operate on a very tight margin as does the district. And so when, when paper and, and pencils and all of these goods have gone up so dramatically, it's really taken a toll. And we're gonna to have to evaluate um, the funding levels per student because we give allocations based on a per student but and we're gonna have to we're gonna have to actually contemplate that i think for 23 24 because we're gonna have to increase that to help offset the impact on our kids because what a dollar bought last year is dramatically different than what a dollar will buy this year and even in just that sort short period of time it's 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 been dramatic so and gasoline and, and gas drives delivery I mean, we've just seen delivery charges go through the roof on many of the goods that we, we see things coming through on purchase orders. So anyway, I'll stop there. All right, thank you. Okay, um, you guys need a break or are you good? All right, okay. Comments from the public on non-agendized items. If you are Zooming in, please put your first and last name in the chat and the item that you would like to comment on if it is not on the agenda. And we will leave the chat open while I read the, our uh, public comment policy. Under government code section 54954.3a, members of the public have the right to address the governing board on any items of interest, providing it relate to the subject matter jurisdiction of the school district. <laughs> Sorry, I had to put my glasses on. Um, while government code allows speakers to criticize the district's policies, procedures, programs, services, and or employees, the district does have a policy specific to complaints against employees. Should comments from the public pertain to a specific district employee, the board requests that the complaint first be submitted in writing to the employee's immediate supervisor for investigation. If the comment is about something that is not on the agenda, it will be heard only during the public comment on non-agendized items period. Once that part of the meeting is over, comments will only be taken on agenda items during the discussion of those items. The board values public comments, and although we cannot take action or discuss items not on the agenda, we listen carefully and appreciate input from the public. Public comments are subject to a four minute per person limit or a 20 minute limit per subject matter. Are there any comments? So we have Freya Sharp who wants to come and speak about appropriate facilities for young learners. Okay. Hi, I'm hoping you can hear me. We can yeah. hear you Freya. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Freya Sharp. I teach TK and McNair. Nice to see you again. I wanted to take a moment to talk about appropriate facilities for our youngest learners and bring to your attention that McNair is the only TK classroom in our district that does not have a bathroom attached to our classroom. This has been a concern since we, since we have housed a TK at McNair. The students have to leave the room and go into the hallway to use the restroom. The closest ones to the TK room are the bathrooms designed for the upper grades. So some parts of it are tricky for them because they're so small, but really the biggest concern is the fact that they have to leave the room and go elsewhere. It's scary as a teacher of these little guys. 
I do have an assistant, but if she was to go to the bathroom with every child all day, she would hardly be in the classroom. They have to go often and it is risky to ask them to wait. <laughs> in the next few years, our TK students will be younger and younger. We'll have children starting school having just turned four. I anticipate that there will be more need for bathroom support because of their age. And I know I will be more concerned about them having to go down the hallway to use the bathroom during the day. The only other classrooms at McNair with bathrooms attached are in the kindergarten, but they need them for the same reasons that TK does. I'm just hopeful that if there's any funding available to rectify the situation in the future, that McNair would be top of the list. If we wanna provide safe, appropriate facilities for all children at PCS, our TK and K kids really need attached bathrooms across the district. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? No? Okay. All right, we will move on to adoption and approval of the agenda. Can I get a motion? I move to adopt and approve the agenda. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, report on activities and correspondence of school board members. And Kylie, I'll email this to you so you don't have to <laughs> Um, okay, so since the last board meeting, Budget Advisory Committee, San Antonio and Valley Oaks office hours, CSBA webinar on governor's budget proposal, Costa Girls basketball games, Healthy Choice Committee, LCAP meeting, CHIPA interview for Petaluma High School Radio, that was Ellen, uh, and the SCO superintendent swearing in ceremony and um, Climate Action Commission meeting. So if anyone wants to make any comments about any of their correspondences or activities or wants to add, go ahead. No comments? Okay, all right. Next up, comments from the public on consent items. I won't reread the board policy, but we will reopen the chat. And if anyone has a comment about something on the consent, Agenda, please put your first and last name in the chat and what you would like to speak about. All right, we can go ahead and close the chat. All right, approval of consent agenda by consolidated motion. I move to pull um, 12.2.3 from the consent agenda. 12.2.3. The warrant register. Oh, okay. All right. Where is this? Uh, I'll second. 12.2.3, just the warrants. I just need to abstain. Okay. You seconded, Sheldon? Yep. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Now I move to approve the consolidated consent agenda as amended. Okay. Does anyone have any questions or comments about anything on the consent agenda? I'm really thrilled to see the uh, child development and careers in education at CASA. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really, really exciting, especially if it turns into a CTE. Yeah. Anyone else? All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstain? Right. No, you abstain? Oh, you're not up. abstaining. Sorry. 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 Okay. Next up. Uh, why don't you move this next one? I can't because I'm not going <laughs> to. No. I'll move to approve Thank item 12.2.3. <laughs> <laughs> all right all in favor aye. aye okay now abstain i abstain okay all right you always helping me out with all of this stuff i have just try right. to not get <laughs> all right comments from the public on action items we will reopen the chat again Please put your first and last name in the chat if you have a comment on something on one of the action items.
All right, I don't see anything. I think we can go ahead and close it. All right, um, Caitlin's favorite action item. I move to stay in hybrid for another 30 days. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. One of the last times we get to do yeah. that. End of an era. <laughs> All right, Jason, next up, uh, approval of provisional internship permit. Just want to talk briefly about this. Yeah, this was um, uh, a teacher that we hired at the beginning of the year working at one of our schools, and we're anticipating that her credential will be done in time for her to continue the year, and she didn't finish. So in order to have her continue working with the students, we need to um, get her on a provisional intern permit, and okay. we're hoping to do that to keep some continuity for that, those students. Okay. I move to approve that permit. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, uh, board resolution for authorizing emergency contracts for the electrical repair work at CASA. Chris, do you wanna talk about this? Yes, as you know, we had um, um, a major electrical equipment failure at CASA um, back in early December, and we found out about it first thing in the morning. And um, we actually had to close down for two days while we tried to assess what had happened and how to repair that. Um, over that weekend, it became very clear that the issue was much more significant than we had anticipated um, and that we would really need to move very quickly in order to be able to um, get a contractor on site, get the repairs done and get the school back up and um, functioning with electricity. As you know, that, that, that Sunday morning, we actually made the decision to get a generator on board, a very large generator on a trailer that was actually able to power up Costa Grande for about three weeks while the repairs were made. So we believe that this clearly is a perfect example that constitutes an emergency under this provision of the Ed Code that allows us to um, bypass the bid, formal bidding process by having the, the board adopt a resolution. Um, it also requires that the county superintendent uphold and affirm that that emergency and this and and we were able to work with Dr. Harrington in December before winter break and we received that approval from him in writing. And so we're asking the board tonight to go ahead and uh, approve this resolution. And then at the next meeting we'll be bringing back the cost and the contract for the repairs and I'm happy to actually confirm that all of the repair work was done by the end of winter break and we were actually able to re-energize building M um, before winter break actually, but over winter break complete any of the necessary repairs. Um, and in a nutshell, we had an 800 amp breaker explode inside the main switch gear. Um, we were able to get that breaker replaced, but then once we tested all of the main electrical feeders, basically the, the wire that goes from the main electrical panel to the building, we determined that um, that wiring needed to be replaced. And that's at least in part what caused the equipment failure. And so all of that electrical wiring has been replaced at this point with much higher levels of insulation, with actual grounding rods or wires in every single conduit, which we found there wasn't. And again, this is 1972 construction. Um, and so the, we believe this, the school site is safe and that the work that we've done um, has actually made it more safe than it was. Because when we actually went in and looked, we were a bit concerned after what we found. So um, the cost is going to be around $300,000. Cheaper than the underground gas repairs, summer of 21. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so we're asking you to uh, um, basically approve this resolution authorizing the emergency contracts for repair work related to that equi equipment shutdown. I need to approve resolution 2223-12. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, um, comments from the public on our discussion and information items. There's just two, we'll reopen the chat briefly. If you have a comment about one of our discussion information items, please put your first and last name in the chat.
All right, let's go ahead and close it, move on to the Williams Settlement Quarterly Uniform Complaint Report. Jason. <laughs> Hi, so this report was for October 1st through December 31st, 2022. And I'm pleased to report that there were no complaints. Yay. Wonderful. Yay. Always good to hear this. Always good news. <laughs> All right, next up, dual language immersion. And I'm guessing that's why Miss Miller is here. Are you here Oh, okay. I didn't know if you were coming to the podium. If you want to move up closer to like the front row, maybe. All right, good evening. Um, happy to be here tonight. We wanna to provide a little update on dual immersion and some of the work from the Superintendent's Lay Advisory Committee. So Matthew will be up here um, with me as we describe a little bit of what's been going on so far. Do you wanna start with sure. Lay Advisory? Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be up here. We, um, we've been meeting with, the, I've explained to some of you individually, so the Superintendent's Lay Advisory Committee, we had about 35, um, I don't know if it's in here or not, 35 um, families or, or parents, guardians who decided to come, which was an incredible um, uh, turnout of parents. And one of the things that, that really struck me was someone said, you really, you, I can tell you really care about our input. Yeah, we do really care about parents. Is, so um, from that group, it was very quickly determined that there were two, um, two very different issues. One of them being, um, a group that really wanted to focus on dual language immersion. So that dual language immersion track that we're working on over at McDowell, we started this year with kindergarten, first and second grade. And then another group that really wanted to focus in on the, the transition from eighth grade to ninth grade. Um, the transition, how do we communicate? How do we sell our school? It's very interesting to hear from some of them. Uh, we talked about some of the pathways. I mean, Fideji sits there, Esmeralda and I, um, Tony as well. and. Some of the, these are some of our most engaged parents. And then we've talked about some of the pathways and they're like, well, we didn't know that you got that Pilum Sizzle offered that, or we didn't realize that about the school. So some of it is about communication and some of it is about how are we, how are we, how are we going to work on, um, we've also did a little research around about hundred to 120 of our students are with us in eighth grade and not with us in ninth grade. And so what are we going to do about keeping those students? And so that's, that's a whole nother committee. So for today, we want to focus in on that dual language immersion um, group. And I think, you know, we, we, we talk about dual language immersion, kindergarten, first grade, kindergarten, first and second grade. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, okay, this is, we're going one year at a time. Next year, we'll, have, we'll add a third grade. Then the year after, we'll add a fourth grade. This group of parents from, um, there's a, a, quite a few, some from Loma Vista, some from McDowell's program that, that are already there in the, in the program, some who have gone to other schools and they had some concerns just about what does that transition look like from sixth to seventh grade look like? What happens, and I know um, Trustee Jen had some students who went from Loma Vista over to Kenilworth, what does that look like? And so that was um, a big concern that kind of came up and I think it's a lot faster than I was intending to go, but I wanna kind of share with, with you all what what came out of that. So we had that large group of parents who met four times. We also then pulled a group of um, the Loma Vista sixth grade families. We had a great conversation. Some, um, some families who were, we kind of asked for some representatives, I think about 15 of the 58 families from Loma Vista, and we did a survey. And so the survey was very clear. About 95% of the families really, one of the big things for, for their seventh and eighth grade experiences, they want dual language immersion. They want to continue on. Once you get up into really fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, you're looking at like a 50-50 model. And so that's kind of where the parents are at. And I'll let Esmeralda jump in here. Sure. So um, as Matthew said, we did administer a survey. We wanted to really poll the families um, at Loma Vista. So many of them were um, represented and had a strong interest. Um, we also know that with the program at McDowell, there is a need for a building a pathway, right? A really strong pathway that not only goes through seventh and eighth grade, but also up into a ninth through 12th. Um, so this group, there was a, just a lot of interest around um, opening a small dual language immersion 
middle school to support this pathway. So coming to the data, so we did survey the, the, the families. Um, this was sent out to all Loma Vista sixth grade um, families and 94.4% of those families have an interest um, saying, yes, we want our child to continue in a dual language immersion program. And then the other question we asked was, if we were to open a small dual language immersion um, junior higher middle school, I, I would enroll my child immediately. So we had about 55.6% saying yes, absolutely. And then a, a bulk of that obviously would want their unsure. They'd want some more information. What does that program look like? And just a small percentage there that said no. So um, what we're looking at um, and exploring currently that we wanted to engage the board in tonight is um, we want to um, look at a charter petition on the McDowell campus um, to support a seventh, eighth grade uh, dual language immersion program. And we believe that it could provide um, supports for these students in the following way. So it would create this really robust language immersion environment on one campus where students can benefit from all of the bilingual staff. We know that obviously English is our dominant language in society. And so we have to be really intentional about creating spaces um, for dual language programs for the students to really practice the language in, in every opportunity they get. This would also um, allow more opportunities for collaboration and articulation. Um, currently, we have um, a dual language um, course or some courses at Kenilworth. And again, there, that, there isn't that proximity, whereas if it was housed just at one campus, then that would really make that collaboration and articulation pretty seamless. Um, this would also create an enhanced student and community connection. So students con uh, connected to teachers and staff and one another for longer periods of time over nine years. It would also foster that deeper understanding of language and culture when they're part of a, a community like that for over nine years. Um, and then there was the parent input was abundantly clear that there is a strong interest around a middle dual language, um, uh, middle school dual language model. Say, so when we talk about the middle school, the middle school versus junior high school, we're really talking about that K-8 model that the parents are, there's a, I mean, just in my conversations, anecdotal conversations, that is really where the, the emphasis is and what, what parents are looking for. I also just want to take an opportunity here to, to talk about, we've, I have reached out to um, the superintendents from Old Adobe, had conversations about, you know, this is not an attempt to um, harm old adult. We really, what I'm really, we're really envisioning down the road is how do we turn Loma Vista Dual Language Academy and McDowell's programs and blend them together when they get into that junior, that middle school, that seventh and eighth grade. And so they're fully aware. In fact, one of the board members from Old Adobe is on the Superintendent Lay Advisor Committee and has been very invested in the process as well. <laughs> That's great. Um, so right now, what we're looking at and considering um, is um, similar to the PACS model, right, where you've got 64 seventh grade students, 64 eighth grade students. Um, so for the 2023-24 school year, it would be we're looking at two seventh grade classes um, of 64 students and then growing that the following year in 24-25 and adding the next um, group of seventh graders and moving those seventh graders up to eighth grade. Um, what's unique about the enrollment um, here is that um, while we're looking at students who are rising seventh graders coming out of a dual language program, a K-6 program, we also want to make sure that we have an inclusive process. To we may have sixth graders at McDowell who perhaps have been a part of the biliteracy Spanish classes. They, they um, have the skills. Um, so we want to make sure that they have an opportunity and any student right, um, would, would have the opportunity if they were to pass a Spanish language placement test to show because really students are coming in and they're taking their core courses um, in Spanish. And so it's not necessarily learning Spanish for the first time, but coming needing to come in with some literacy, um, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And so as you know, so today, tonight, this is a discussion item. We're just we're up here talking. Um, the idea is we spent quite as well and I spent quite a considerable amount of time writing the charter, getting things ready, working with attorneys, and where our plan is to bring that to you in, in, in a couple of weeks. So sort of for next steps. Um, we've 
so this has been successful, but we've, we've been had a lot of success with this before. So thinking about the PAX model, uh, I think last year was named US, not that we put a lot of stock in this, but US News and World Report rated number one middle school in the state of California. Um, we're, our goal is to sort of create something very similar. We, we, we've got a playbook that we're working on. And when we talk about, you know, 64 seventh graders, what we're really just, you know, describing here is in an ideal world, we have two seventh grade teachers and two eighth grade teachers down the road. The two, we have a, you know, as an example, you could have math and science and English, you have your um, Spanish language arts and history in Spanish. You're doing about 50, 50, you know, between 40 and 60% of your day in Spanish, 46% of your day in, in English. Um, they, they would then do their, have some PE electives, potentially another elective and, um, really giving the students that that rich opportunity in a middle in a middle school model that prepares them for high school and i think we're going to get to the the next component high school right in this yeah. Yeah. sorry we yes <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> well that's um yeah something to be really excited about is um we've already had we were invited to the casa grande um, world languages department meeting early last fall because um, we hadn't yet even launched the idea of the the k6 dual language program and we had um teachers over there were just really excited and wanted to be a part of laying that foundation and future planning and so um with this concept certainly it will speed up the process for the casa grande world languages department but moving forward we see these students being able to at the end of eighth grade um receive a pathway award for on their way to the california seal of biliteracy um getting that bilingual attainment award and then ultimately being able to take core courses in Spanish, um, perhaps math in Spanish or a translation class, or just, it really opens up a lot of opportunity for discussion with the Casa Grande World Languages Department. Um, and again, the world, the uh, California Seal by Literacy is already um, in practice. And so um, we would want our students to be prepared to enter into those courses um, and have access to those advanced placement classes right away in their freshman, sophomore year. Um, so any comments or questions? So I just want to ask Ms. Miller if you want to, any comments or anything that you want to share before we... Well, I'm really excited to be a part of this process. I've been really appreciative to be brought into the fold of Petaluma City Schools and welcomed like um, wide, wide armed, open arms. So I appreciate everyone that has come out and visited us over at McDowell and all of the support that you've given us. And it has just been so amazing to see um, just all of the love and energy that's coming over to McDowell. And there's a lot of excitement there. And, um, and while it is the growth is happening fast, um, th there's a big need in our community and people have been asking for this for a long time. And so there's um, a lot of excitement to see that idea of having a dual immersion, um, basically the PAX model, but dual immersion style happening. And I know that um, families are very, very grateful. Like Matthew said, when he was holding these lay advisory committees, the parents were just overwhelmed by the fact that the superintendent actually wants to hear what they have to say. And not just as he sit and listen, but he, take to, he takes to heart what the families have shared and is actually rolling out a plan to help meet their needs and, um, and the needs of our community. So I just wanna thank you all for your support and I'm excited to be part of the team and excited for the direction that Petaluma City Schools is going. So thank you. And I'm getting in, um, also people are moving up here. A lot of people keep moving from um, the Bay Area up to Petaluma. And so we keep getting a lot of, I'm doing tours every week, twice a week of people moving up to the area and they want to be part of what we're doing in Petaluma City School. So the word is getting out. So thank you, everyone. My only comment is I'm a huge proponent of the K-8 model. I think that's really the way to go. Um, so go, <laughs> that's what I got to say. My only question is why, I'm not against it being a charter school at all. Why does it have to be a charter school? Is it gonna be a separate seven, eight charter school or is McDowell turning into a TK through eight charter school? What, what, yeah, what? So Chris, feel free to jump in here too. We went around, 
we went round and round and round with this because um, similarly, I think as, as Principal McKinley, when we decided, I was just thinking, let's just make it a K-8 school uh, at, at McKinley and we decided, okay, the PACS model partially, so some of this has to do with, um, with funding. So we don't interrupt McDowell's uh, you know, Title I supplemental funding. It's a separate school. So there it's it is a it is a it is a clearly a middle school model, seven, eight school. It's not we're not touching McDowell, it's still K6 district school. We're not touching that. Seven, eight would be charter. So essentially what we're saying is as an elementary school district, we're K6 school district, just like all the other districts in town. We are the only secondary district in town. So we are taking a secondary, we are creating a secondary school that will be part of the secondary district. And we are placing it at the McDowell campus. We could place it at Kendall, we could place it at Pendleton Junior, we could place it at Valley, Valley Vista, we could place it anywhere. We're, we're, but what we're saying is we're taking a secondary school, chartering it and putting it here. So then there's also no confusion as far as um, going up into seventh and eighth grade. It's really open to any student who's, in the state of California is your tenants area. We will have priorities. We'll have, you know, McDowell school will obviously be the initial, the clear feeder school. But for, for now, I mean, we also want students from Loma Vista. So we'll have to see how things go. But so I, he, I hear the question and I'm, it's not like I'm a big, oh my gosh, what did you charter everything? It's not, not me at all. It's really, um, yeah, we, we went back and forth about thinking about Kate. So Chris, I'd love to hear your, your take on it too. Pax is a charter on McKinley's campus that is a district. Yeah. And, and of course, it would be a dependent charter school. They would follow the same CBA, our collective bargaining agreement. Everything would be the same. It's just it's charter in name only. It's a dependent charter. And in accounting. And in accounting. <laughs> well, it will be one more local control funding formula that we do. I do think that there are potentially some um, real benefits financially to doing a charter. I think exactly what Matthew said, keeping McDowell separate from a socioeconomic status and making sure that we don't impact that. I think for McKinley PACs, what that allowed is McKinley to gently move as the demographic shifted without throwing in a bunch of, of students that then completely changed the demographic for the school site. I think that's an, a very compelling reason. The other thing is what we find with categorical programs and COVID was a perfect example of this, is that a lot of categoricals, charters get a minimum amount. Like you get a per pupil funding amount, but the minimum is 50,000. The minimum is 75,000. And so what happens is the per pupil funding amount, if it was combined K-8 might be this, but because it's a charter, it's gonna get a minimum of X number of dollars, which would be greater than the minimum funding that we would get on the natural. So there is some potential benefit financially depending on how the categorical funding works. And that's kind of what we've seen. Um, there's other reasons providing greater flexibility. I mean, there, there is flexibility that the charters enjoy that um, non-charters don't necessarily have access to. And I think we've seen that at PACS as well. So it's also something that we have to be very mindful of. How do we, because enrollment is a very different thing you know what I mean? The state of California becomes the school of resident or the boundary. Right. So however, um, that's that's true. But we can also in the charter, as we write the charter, we define, we determine levels of priority. And so, you know, we can say, I mean, for example, the PAX charter, which I know very well, McKinley School has priority students with siblings or a sibling in PAX, siblings in McKinley students who go to McKinley, students who are in the attendance area of McKinley, students who are in Petaluma City Schools attendance area. Um, and then with a secondary school, of course, that would include Old Adobe because they're in within our secondary boundaries. Um, and then out, typically then it's outside of, of Petaluma City Schools secondary boundaries is where, where it would go next. He's absolutely so. right. I mean, we, we, we would wanna be very mindful about how we set those priorities in a very objective, non-discriminatory way, but also we can, we can set capacity a maximum space, you know? So capacity is also a very objective way to say, we can't take any more students above this level for whatever, you know what I mean? Our capacity is established at. Yes, all of that is part of the, um, the charter document and then other documents that go with it. So 
And we probably would have to redo again our enrollment policy to kind of incorporate that in because policy then becomes very pertinent to the charter as well. So, so I think that there are some real benefits to doing it. Um, the accounting is probably the, the, <laughs> the, the drawback if there's a con. <laughs> I'm getting really good at LCFF calculations. So anyway, so there, you know, we would have to create a separate fund. We would have, you know, there are things that we would do um, to make that happen, but we, we're certainly capable of doing that. So. Well, yeah, I can't tell you the numbers, but I haven't been crunching all those, but definitely a lot of the families go to, um, they'll go up to maybe Runner Park, and they're looking for schools with smaller middle school models, like Lawrence Jones is a big draw for a lot of our families, or a lot of their families there, so um, definitely that's, um, there has been, I don't know what the numbers are, but there's been a lot of loss of the students, and with the percentages from, yeah, from, instead of, Correct. So they're living, so they're giving up the dual immersion, which was the dream, but in, but they want to be able to have that small school focus, even though we've been working. Um, I know Petaluma City School has been working with Kenilworth to create this dual immersion extension, but it's been a real challenge to develop that because we don't have um, experts really in dual immersion, or we didn't at the time to be able to really support that model. So um, yeah, it's definitely going to help with not just retention, but also drawing other students in. Yeah, a, a good yeah. chunk of Loma students' uh, families are interdistrict transfers from outside of the area. Oh, so yeah. they're not ours to lose, per se. They're going back because there's not a dual immersion option at junior yeah, high. Yeah, and we are, proximity-wise, we do have other dual language programs. So, you know, Linwood, as it's part of Novato Unified, um, they're still early in their development. I think they're their oldest grade level is maybe entering six. So these are communities, parents that are going to be looking for options. Um, and many times you see, you see it in Sonoma Valley too, where the dual language program is a strand within a school, much like maybe the vision for Kenilworth was. And so this would be a unique opportunity in Sonoma County to have a small um, dual language immersion focused program. And that's, be, that's the only program, right, for those students um, on, a, on a K-6 campus or for K-8. So I, I love the, I love that where this is going with the seventh and eighth grade. In my own head, I can think of advantages of putting it at either uh, Petaluma Junior or Kenilworth. So I just want to hear what the rationale, what the thought process was and why you think uh, McDowell is the best place for it. Um, so yeah, coming back to what I shared earlier, I think one of the things um, with creating an environment that can really intentionally support um, and give students that really strong, robust experience with the language and culture as for a whole community. And so because we have the dual language program already at McDowell that's building, there can be a lot of you know, cross-age tutoring, a lot of sort of support um, and articulation up from you know, TK all the way up to eighth grade. And so um, really creating, you know, we've got bilingual staff, bilingual principals. So it's this whole, you wanna create this immerse, immersive environment um, so that students are immersed in the language, the target language, which is Spanish. And so really being thoughtful and intentional about that. So, and I think- So it's a thought that McDowell Elementary is gonna be completely DI? So we're not at that point yet. We still have our English strand there. And so really, I think this year we'll see with enrollment, what are the TK and K numbers looking like, but there, there isn't a goal to eliminate the English only strand um, at this point. No, we're really wanting to have those options for the families that reside in that area, um, whether it be on the dual language side of the house or um, the English only strand. And I think, you know, so to your question, uh, where so the school that I most recently when I was a teacher in down in, in Los Angeles in, in um, Lawndale, there were two. So exactly, I taught third grade in the dual language immersion strand. There were two other third grade teachers at the school, and they both taught an English only strand. So there were two strands of English only and one strand of dual language in the whole school. Love to see that. We, we've talked to the staff at McDowell about that. Would be wonderful. And it also depends on 
enrollment. Families, I mean, this is this, this is why, the same answer to your other question about why McDowell, because I thought about Petaluma Jr., I've thought about Valley Vista, I've thought about Kennel, we've thought about all these different places where it could go. And ultimately what the families, what that group of families is sharing is they're, what they're really looking for is a middle school, like a K-8 model. That was one of the highest things on the priorities that they, that they listed. And um, so that's, and then also to Esmeralda's point, it, yeah, it, it's a building this culture and building this magnet of this is where we have, and, and if it grows and we have more demand then we look at other campuses as well. That's sort of the, the big rationale. The infrastructure is already there at McDowell. You've already started it. Um, yeah. And putting it on either Kennewith or Petaluma takes away from the small K-8 experience. So I can see why. Um, so given all of this, um, I think I'm really excited about it. I think it sounds fabulous. I've been convinced. Um, <laughs> I really have, I really have to say that I worry about the McDowell students. We did this. I really want to make that a real high priority that any student there, whether they're in dual immersion or not, we did this for, you know, to give McDowell a chance to really, you know, we put the dual immersion there very intentionally. And I don't want to see that dissipated. I don't want to see that um, uh, passion for them, the respect for their, for all of those families and how they, the community there is so wonderful when you go there. And, and I just, I, I, I don't know how you can write that into a charter, but um, I, to I, make that priority more than just wording. Yeah. Does that make I sense? I 100% agree with you. So I too, my, my two sons are at the school. That's right. <laughs> and um, it'll definitely be, you know, listed amongst the, the priorities when we create, when we actually do create the charter. And um, I, I think that, you know, dual language inherently creates this diversity, right, on the campus. And you're seeing it more and more at McDowell. And, you know, Ms. Miller can speak firsthand to what she sees, as, as can I. Um, and so I totally agree. I mean, that the idea is going to be, make, you know, this is why too, I wasn't even contemplating this. I mean, honestly, I think this, this past summer, I went and met with several, um, several families and Ms. Miller. And they were talking to me about dual language and, and middle school model. And, and I just kept saying, yeah, I mean, maybe in like five years or six, four or five years when that second grade group gets up to sixth grade. I mean, I, this is not, in other words, this isn't my, brainchild i always thought in the back of my head like you know a few years out the parents i mean when they say you know oh you actually listen to us this, this is us listening to the parents i mean their parents are um asking for this sort of model and they want it sooner than later and so um i never thought i'd be up here saying this right now but here we are and and um, trying to be responsive to, to the families and i agree with you the mcdowell families who, who are there and who are you know there's there's a capacity for students. I, I want to set everyone up for success, but we'll be talking with the sixth grade families and saying, you know, is there is there interest? Is there because it, it's different, right? You're not going to go to seventh grade and we're going to start all over and say, oh, you don't speak any Spanish. You never have had any a, a word of Spanish in your life. Here's welcome to seventh grade. Um, we're going to we're going to start teaching you the colors and the letters. We're not doing that. It's it's liter it's designed for for students who have been through. A dual language program or or have the spanish some spanish fluency spanish and english fluency because it's bilingual biliteracy biculturalism so it's do you have the capacity to do this wonderful then we we bring them bring them in the fold but you're going to be actually learning uh history as potential history or math or science in spanish and so it's it's a different level of spanish that's needed to be part of that kind of a program yeah i hear what you're saying maddie because it sounds like um i don't want to put words in your mouth but like we increase the grade span for dual immersion because of like uh, we had more families from old Adobe come over and it sounds like we're doing this. It sounds like it's primarily old Adobe families gonna be going into seventh grade. And so just wanting to make sure that we have the space for the McDowell families. Cause I don't know how many of them were on the panel, you know, who were surveyed. Um, 
and I don't know if they realize that they don't have first priority, you know? Yeah, yeah that's what I'm asking, that they would have that. But it sounds like the panel was made up of mostly old Adobe families. So then do they realize yeah, so, that they're not going to have the so first So we priority? surveyed those families for this coming year mm -hmm. because so we would know the kind of numbers in order to have the two sections of seventh grade. But we are, uh, but we're presenting this to you tonight and we're coming up with a plan and then we're going to be presenting it to our families as well. Okay. And so we haven't done that yet just because we have, we're trying to gather the, the idea first and get it off the ground. But we absolutely do um, preserve and recognize our neighborhood families as having the primary uh, access. And so that's the reason why we're going to be creating the entry exams not so then it's not like it's an accelerated program but they have to have basic proficiency in spanish and and then they will be welcome in our middle school and the teachers are also really excited they're actually forming a unification committee because they really want to maintain this strand like what matthew was talking about where there's one english class and two dual immersion classes mm -hmm. because that is actually a very powerful model because it's really good to have strong, competent English teachers on a campus. And, and when we eliminate that, um, it's hard to find people that are strong and competent in both languages. And so what we're working with right now, our staff is um, really coming together to try to sell our program as a two, two strand program. So we have the traditional English only with Spanish as an additional class and enrichment opportunity, and then that dual immersion, but the teachers we're working on getting them where they can be working together. So they're teaching the same standards and you see the same thing happening in both classrooms. One just happens to be the language of instruction is English and the other one is Spanish, but also they can work together with the grade level partners and the students and they can provide enrichment opportunities with those classes as well. So we're working on that and the teachers are excited about that because they also <laughs> wanna have a place, our English only teachers as we're growing this program. So, Maddie, I appreciate you bringing that up. And we are really trying to um, be very intentional with not um, with supporting this is we're building this for our community. And then if we have room, as we do, we welcome others to come and join us as well. So thank you. Any other questions, concerns? Along those same lines, you're just thinking, what is it, five years down the line when <laughs> when the two classes in McDowell are junior high age, do we have like capacity at McDowell for four seventh grade classrooms and four eighth grade classrooms? So do we, do we have capacity? I think um, two part answer here. So first, do we have the capacity? Yes, we do have the capacity. If you think back 15 years, 15, 20 years when McDowell was in its heyday, you know, there were six, 700 students at the campus. We have about 260 students this year. So do we have capacity? Yes. Are we in the charter? What are we, what are we looking for? We're, really, we're looking, looking for those two side-by-side -side classrooms. Five years from now, when we go to re renew, we may be looking to see there may be the demand, or we may say, we're going to open up another campus at it, it'll really depend at that time but i think for now that the two classrooms should be adequate for what we, what i'm thinking for the demand for the next several years um that the second grade class that is our the furthest along at mcdowell you know they've got a ways to go before they get to seventh grade when that happens then we will see and, and we'll we'll see what happens with the, the mcdowell sixth graders this year we may be surprised how many want to stay in that in that sort of a model so but it, it will probably retain it will create the need for us to rethink programs that might yes currently be operating there and yeah. also um it kind of accelerates in my mind the need to be continuing to improve the facility at all of our campuses in particular um mcdowell and a couple other ones so i'm thinking of things like multi and making sure yep. there's a, because the challenge with a middle school or jun, a, a small junior high is that you ha also have to have the facilities for those students you know what i mean but 
but McDowell is a large campus. They have a massive field, just like McKinley. Mm -hmm. They have a, a large blacktop. Relatively speaking, if you think about Pengrove, has a much smaller blacktop for twice as many kids. So I do think there's a lot of opportunity to, for us to look at the spaces and say, how can we, even through something as simple as striping, striping a track onto the blacktop so that a seventh or eighth grade model can, you know what right. I mean? So there will be the need as this rolls out to look at those facilities and say, how do we need to kind of rethink um, and, and perhaps repurpose? And then, you know, pedagogically, they've got, they need dance, they have dance at middle school dances, right? They have PE teacher that's going to be working. I mean, they have doubled the number of minutes for PE. They have all the kind of growing pains that we went through at McKinley. I mean, they have, we joined a small sports league. They're going to be, you know, they could be part of that as well. So I see lots of great things for the, you know, in the future for it. But And um, a different bell schedule and a different bell structural schedule. minute. And they don't have recess. They have break. They have, don't have, you know, all these. So along those lines, so I don't think of McKinley as a K, TK through eight. I think of it as a TK through six. And then we have PACs. So you said earlier that that you wanted uh, it to be like thought of as a TK through eight. Is it how do you how do you, how do I put this? Um, I'm not being very articulate. Um, I would prefer it to be a TK through eight. Is there something that we have to do or that you have to do to? And I love the idea of having all these different seventh and eighth grade activities you know on the campus it changes you know you get lockers or whatever um but uh <laughs> i went to a k, k through eight um but i also I, so i really want to encourage it to be a tk through eight and and so how do we avoid it being like two different schools I, well i think part of it too is when we're, when we're talking about the school and you're bringing new families into TK or kindergarten, and you're saying, and here you have the opportunity to stay for, yeah. if you're starting in TK, you have the opportunity to stay here for 10 years. And you have this ma massive investment in the school. I also think, you know, the more students, particularly now that we have a, a dual language program, again, only second graders, but as they, as they matriculate up, I think the, the clear expectation is going to be that they, they stay and they're, they're a part of it. So it's, we're, we've built the program in kinder first and second to move forward in into that kind of a model. Any other any other questions? I'm excited. It's my neighborhood school. You guys are gonna make right. me have a baby. <laughs> 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 me or Alan, do you have any questions or comments? Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, future business. Alan or Mia, do you guys have anything for future business? Anything you want to see on a future agenda? Any topics? Um, this wouldn't really be anything that would go on the agenda, but recently I had um, interviewed Ellen for a project in my broadcast journalism class, but we thought that it wouldn't be very fair to um, air a interview like that without doing without interviewing all of you guys. So I was wondering if all the board members <laughs> would like to at some point during the semester sit down with me and do an interview for a children broadcast. Yeah, of course. Yeah? It's of really painful. She's really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Thank you guys. Yeah. I also just want to add, um, I know we, we had talked about diverse fair narrative and I'm uh, working with Tony, Tony's out this week, but when he's back, I'm looking either the 31st or uh, the first uh, first meeting in February to do an update on diverse fair narrative. Thank you. So. Yeah. <laughs> can, can I uh, put on some future agenda, spring or summer, the um, bond issue that we talked about earlier, just initial needs yeah. assessment, planning, scoping, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's great. Great idea. 
Yeah. Sure. Yeah. You can put those two together. <laughs> well, now you have to make a comment now that you've disrupted. <laughs> do you have any future business as well? <laughs> and we also do have the study session, right? In I think it's March. March. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about we're talking about um, equity. So yeah. we'll talk a little bit about some of the, the, fir the first water mm -hmm. and then also looking at a from a financial perspective, financial. Yeah. So mm -hmm. equity in, this, in our schools and equity financially, yeah. uh, that what that looks like. Yeah, the financial yeah. part uh, being both philanthropic, but then also the pay as you go issues that we see mm -hmm. we're seeing on campus that we're talking about in Maddie's group, uh, you know, about the all, all the out of pocket expenses that different families might have. Oh, yeah. Exactly. That's a lot. So we can, are we at this special study? Are we going to actually get to meet the people who want to join? Yes. Yeah, they're planning to be here, okay. right? Yeah. They'll be here. It was, Oof. it's in the calendar. Anything else? All right. Moving on to action on items heard in closed session. There were two items, um, item 4.1, um, yeah. settlement of case number 10814269 and case number 15108390. They were both uh, approved five to zero. All right, and with that, we are adjourned.